at Stand Up. Hey, come on, all the dads stand up. Everyone, come on, come on. We love you guys. Thank you so much. Give them a hand. We love you dads. Thank you so, so much. It's a special, special day. Uh, we want to encourage everyone this morning, when you came in, you should have received a program. Inside that program is a very special card we're going to use in our service. If you did not get a bulletin this morning and you walk in, would you raise your hand? We've got some folks that will get you one. These are really important for what we're going to do in a few minutes. Raise your hand. Anybody not get a bulletin? Everybody's got one? What a great morning. That's the first time that's ever happened. Good job, guys. Thankful for that. These cards are so important because in just a couple of minutes, uh, as I begin my message, uh, we're going to let the Lord just work on your heart. And as I share my message, as you reflect on the songs that we sang on the Lord's Supper that we were all blessed to partake of a minute ago, there's a, a, a box in this card that says, prayer request or praise. We just want you to commune with the Lord and write a praise in here or write a prayer request in here as well. I'm also, at the end of my message, going to give you one more opportunity to write something else on this card to offer yourselves this morning. At the end of our service, the very end of our service, we're going to pass baskets down, and we're going to invite you to offer yourself with these cards. So it's important that everyone has a card, and just let the Lord speak to you this morning uh, during that time. We are so thankful today that we have three families that are coming to join the Shannon Oaks Church this morning. I didn't get this, get a chance to hug the Blues this morning. Where are the Blues this morning? Are the Blues here? I didn't see them. There they are at the very back. Good, good. Come on, all of y'all stand up. Jackie and Rachel, stand up. Uh, we're very thankful to have your family. That's going to include uh, Tempe, Titus, Hannah, and Nixie. And we're so thankful to have the Blues with us. Uh, they have been at Shannon Oaks in a previous time, and they're coming back, and we're so thankful to have you with us. Let's give the Blues a round of applause. Great to have the Blues. We're also thankful this morning to welcome someone else who has actually been serving this church for months. In fact, she's serving back at the back right now. Her name is Taylor Green. Taylor's right back here. And Taylor, guys, stand up, Taylor, so we can see you. And we're so glad to have Taylor with us as well. You can give Taylor a round of applause. <laughs> Taylor, I know this can be hard for you to believe, but that tall dude with the, the uh, guitar named Jacob up here, Taylor belongs to Jacob. They are, they are dating. And Taylor is working right now on becoming an elementary ed teacher. She'll be finished in about a year and a half, and we're excited for her as she moves toward that goal in her life. And again, we're already thankful that Taylor is already using her talents and her abilities here. And then we have Jerry and Wanda Crabtree. Where is Wanda? Would you stand up? Stand up, Wanda. We're really glad to have Jerry and Wanda with us. Uh, we are so thankful. They, they come from the Central uh, Baptist Church here in town to, to join us here and, and Wanda, we're so thankful to have you with us, and Jerry as well. And uh, all, all the families who were just standing up a minute ago, we want all of you to know that we will do all we can as your spiritual family to love you and encourage you and support you and help you find your place of service here. And during your ups and your downs in your spiritual life, we are here to stand beside you, and we love you guys. Let's give all three of those families a hand again. We're glad to have all those families with us here at Shannon Oaks. Well, we are in the process as a church of, of appointing new leaders in our spiritual family, shepherds. And we did an entire series on it. they smell like sheep as I explained to you what a New Testament elder was. And today is the last Sunday that we're inviting you to submit to us the names of the men that you would like to serve as our leaders in this church. The cards are right at the back next to our giving boxes. And again, for every person you nominate, we ask you to write your name at the top and then their name and then place those in the box. And today's the last Sunday. As we go through this process, we are well aware that this is a time for our church 
to be united, to be together as one, as a spiritual family. So we're spending a few weeks on one of the greatest texts in all the Bible about unity. It's a text in Philippians chapter 2. You know, this word unity is so powerful. It's so powerful. Whether you take the, the word from the Spanish language, from the Latin, or from the English, the word basically means this. It's when the plural, the two or more, become the singular one. They become one. About 22 years before the phrase United States of America was penned on the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Franklin placed this advertisement in newspapers in all 13 colonies. It's one of the most powerful slogans of all time. The slogan, as you can see, was, Join or die. The oppression from King George III in England was heavy upon the 13 colonies. And yet these 13 colonies were so diverse. In New England, you had the Puritans and those that focused on theocracy. In the South, you had colonies based on making money, who religion was not their focus at all. You had colonies such as Massachusetts. This colony was, was basically based on the idea that religion would rule. And then you had a colony way down south to Georgia, a colony basically that came together as England emptied out its prisons and wanted to send its prisoners to work off their debt and their prison time somewhere. And they settled them way down in Georgia. You had colonies like Maryland that were established because we were basically a group of 13 Protestant colonies, but where could the Catholics be safe? And so Maryland was that safe haven. The point is, as Franklin writes this, you had this incredible diversity of people. And yet Franklin says, we must join together or we will die. That's the power of unity. More locally, more current, when you think back to December 31st, 1972, you think of a man by the name of George Allen who was hired by the Washington Redskins. If you know the 1960s, the mid-60s through the early 70s, the Dallas Cowboys dominated professional football along with the Green Bay Packers. And when you came to the city of Washington, the Washington Redskins, they were a doormat until they hired George Allen. George Allen's idea was, we're going to give away our draft picks, and I'm going to bring in all these old veterans that everybody wants to get rid of, and I'm going to bring them together, and we're going to win. In fact, his slogan was, the future is now, the Dallas Cowboys were the reigning world champions on December 31st, 1972, when they met the Redskins in our nation's capital. And just before these old veterans were about to go out and play the greatest team in the world, this is what George Allen said to his men. Forty men together can't lose. And those old dudes went out, and they beat the Dallas Cowboys 26-3. to That's the power of unity. But the unity we're talking about is not the unity of a country. It's not the unity of a sports team. It's the unity so precious that our Lord Jesus, on the night before he was to be hung, he prayed the night before he would hang on a cross, his hands and his feet nailed to that cross as he hung there. The night before that passion, he prayed, Father, my prayer is not just for my disciples, but for those who will come after them, speaking of us, that they might be one, Father, as we are one. 
The question is, why did Jesus pray that prayer? He gives us the answer in John 17, 23, when he says, so that the world may know that you sent me and you love them even as I have loved you. This series that we're in for these short four or five weeks, they are so critical that even Christ prayed about it. Because the world is watching us. They're watching us as a, as a family of believers. Are we truly a church that's together as one? Jesus says it's one of the greatest testimonies you can have. That's why when you say the book of Acts, and you see all these people from all over the world came together at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. They accepted Christ. They were baptized into Christ. And then they stayed in Jerusalem so they could learn about Jesus Christ. And when you get to Acts chapter 4, it says this. All the believers were one in heart and mind and soul. And that testimony would ring out throughout Jerusalem and the rest of the world as people came to know Christ. And so this morning, we're going to continue our series in Philippians, a series that John MacArthur so beautifully entitled that I read, Formula for Spiritual Unity. It really is. Philippians 2 is a formula for what Christ wants us to be. And last week, as we studied this formula, what we saw in Philippians 2, 1 through 2, we saw the motives for unity. Let's read again Philippians 2, 1 through 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any co common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Last week, here's what we saw. We saw last week that the whole idea of spiritual unity and that motive comes from verse 1. It comes from verse 1. So I want to encourage you to open up your, your Bibles this morning, open up your programs, and let's look at this whole idea of unity in verses 1 and 2. Last week we saw where Christ was our motive, where the Holy Spirit was our motive. And this morning we're going to move into this whole idea of what does unity look like? How are we to view it? What is its nature? What is its essence? How is it defined? And so this morning we're going to focus on verse 2. Verse 2. And so let's look at verse 2. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, by being like-minded. Now this, in fact, we're going to spend quite a bit of time here. What in the world is Paul telling the church at Philippi? To be like-minded, that a unified church is marked by being of the same mind. You've got to dig into this to find out, what's he, are you saying that all of us are to think alike? Is that what he's saying? Well, the Greek word is the word for narrow, and this is what it means. You ready for this? It means to think the same way, to think the same way. A key to unity is thinking alike. Now, let me show you, first of all, a little contrast. Let me show you a church that did not think alike. That's the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth will be a comparative verse for us. This is a church that is disrupted terribly. It has all kinds of factions, all kinds of schisms. And so as Paul introduces in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, this is his prayer for them. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united, here it is, in mind and thought. Is that possible? There's no divisions among us here at Shannon Oaks that we are going to be perfectly united in our thinking and in our judgment. 
We all agree that there's no divisions. We have the same mind, the same judgment. Let me tell you what I think Paul is not saying. I do not believe that Paul is saying this, that every one of us in here have to agree 100% on every doctrine. I don't believe he's saying that. I don't, that's not what thinking alike means. But rather, listen to me, church. It's something much deeper than that. You know, last week, I'm working on this message. It's kind of funny. I'm working on this message, and they're having a Bible study in the conference room next to my office. And they're being kind of loud in there. It's coming through as I'm trying to study. These dudes that study on Wednesday morning. And I hear one of the, the guys that's in there say this. I guess somehow the second coming of Christ came up and the end days. And so one of the brothers says this. I'm not a big end time guy. And the other brother shot back really quick. I am. And here, here, I'm working on this message, and I'm hearing these two brothers say this to each other. So you may ask, can those two guys have the same mind? And the answer is yes. And in fact, I know that they do. Because what we're really talking about, church, here, we're talking about attitude. It's the mindset. It's the same disposition. In fact, I want you to notice in chapter 2, verse 5 of Philippians, look at this with me. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset. Now, here we go. As Christ Jesus. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. How are we unified? That we have the same mindset of Jesus. In the same chapter, in verse 19, he's going to contrast that. Paul's going to say, regarding the ungodly, they set their minds not on Christ Jesus. They set their minds on earthly things. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. What we're talking about is something deeper than just a doctrine. We're talking about your feelings, your disposition, your common thinking pattern, your concern, your understanding. You may say, Jeff, how do we get to that as a church? How do we get to that mindset of being like Christ? Last night, my wife and I just finished watching a series that we've watched over the last several months, Downton Abbey. I don't know if there's any Downton Abbey fans in here or not, but it's a, it's, I don't know, it's five or six seasons. But if you watch that, it's about a, 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 an abbey, a, a Downton Abbey, a, a place like a castle in England. And you watch these people in the 1800s and early 1900s, all the way up to 1925 and 6. You watch this family move in and out with the servants and the owners, the servants and the owners. And at one point in this series, you're going to see they're going to do a fox hunt. They may do it twice, actually. Well, in a fox hunt, what they would do is they would have one rider. And this one rider who would ride around, he would be called the whipper in. He would have a whip, obviously, and he would whip in the dogs with his horse. He'd ride around, he'd whip in the dogs. So the dogs would all stay unified as they went toward. If you think about Parliament right now, Parliament has a whip right now. Whether it's in Canada or in England, and what that whip does is he gets his party together and he makes sure that everyone in his party are all thinking alike. They're voting together. That is unity on a fleshly level. That'd be like me making sure every one of you guys think the same thing from my flesh, me encouraging you. That is not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about the divine, that you and I would be so plugged in to Jesus that we would think the same way Jesus thinks. Wow. I mean, that's powerful stuff. So let's just look at some other places in the New Testament where we see Fernero again. Let's look and see. So, uh, for example, in Romans chapter 8, look at this. As Paul writes to the church at Rome, he kind of, we're going to start in mid-sentence here. In order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, 
who do not live, look now, according to the flesh. We're not whippers in. We're not whippers in. We don't live according to the flesh. But according to the Spirit, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. You've got two possibilities in your, in your walk with Christ. You can either walk in the flesh or you can walk in the Spirit. That's your choice. And to have unity in a church, you want people who have submitted to Christ, who walk in Christ, who have the mindset of Christ. What's the opposite of that? It's when you have your own agenda. You seek your own fleshly desires, your own unredeemed humanness, and you got to get that out of you. It's what the Puritans called the remaining sin that must be mortified in you. At the end of this message, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give an invitation. And when I close out, I'm going to talk about two things. But the second thing I'm going to talk about is what in you needs to be mortified? What is keeping you from totally having the mind of Christ? I want you to be pondering that, opening up your heart to that as we go through this. We've got to get individually in this church beyond our own agenda, our own priorities, our own little enterprise our own little turf, our own personal ambition, our own little fortress that we try to maintain and we try to defend. Look at Romans 15, verse 5. In Romans 15, it says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other. What's that based on? It's based on that's what Christ Jesus had. We think the same way Christ thinks. It's so simple. We surrender ourselves to Jesus. At the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, as Paul closes out to this divided church, this is what he says. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Here it is. Be of one mind and live in peace. Be like-minded. The best place I found in the New Testament that talks about this is Colossians chapter 3. I mean, guys, if you just don't remember anything I say today, but you just focus on this chapter today, you'll be different, you'll be transformed. Paul says, since then, believers... You've been raised with Christ. Here it is. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And if we read that whole chapter, here's what he would go on to say those things are. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just listen. Here it is. The zinger, as the Lord forgave you, so also you should. And beyond all these things, Paul says, put on love. And he closes out by saying this, which is the perfect bond of unity. Now look how he closes out verses 15 and 16. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Here it is. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Some translations say dwell in you. That's a better rendering of the Greek. Dwell in you. This is not what it says. It doesn't say let the word of Christ be in your head. Know all the scripture you can. No. It says, let that word of Christ go from your head to your hearts so you live out who Jesus is. You're not on your own agenda. You think mature thoughts, you think spiritual thoughts, you think heavenly thoughts. Your thinking process is energized, 
by the dominant and richly dwelling of the Word of Christ in your heart. That is why in a couple of weeks when this series is over, you and I are going to step in to a new series called They Had Been With Jesus. And we're going to walk verse by verse with the disciples in the Gospel of Matthew. It may take us a year and a half to get through this book. That's okay. You and I are going to walk with the disciples in the Gospel of Matthew with Jesus so that we emerge and people see us, they're going to say, that guy has been with Jesus. That person has been with Jesus. That person. Have you ever been around someone like that? When I was a, a freshman at Abilene Christian University, I had some friends that were upperclassmen, and, and we would gather in the fall of 1976 outside the student center. We called it the Bean, and we would drink Cokes or eat or whatever, and we'd be outside. And, and since I had upperclassmen friends, I played football, so I had upperclassmen friends. This upperclassman guy would come by quite often and talk to us. I did not know him, but they knew him well. He's this red-haired dude. His dad was worked in the oil field in Andrews, Texas. So from this little bitty town, this red-haired dude comes to this little bitty college of 4,000 people in this little bitty area of West Texas. But when he came by every day and he would talk to my buddies, he wasn't like anybody else on our campus. I mean, I know he's 22 years old. I was 18, and I just, I just watched him. There was a, a humility about him, a peace about him, a sparkle in his eyes, a love for Jesus that I had never seen. And I took note of that. That guy from Andrews, Texas, would leave ACU and go to Brazil, and he could not contain his love for Jesus. He just couldn't contain it. And so he started writing. He wrote this book called, No Wonder They Call Him Savior. And he just kept writing, and he just kept writing, and he just kept writing. And he became the most prolific Christian writer in the last 40 years. His name is Max Licato. And I want to tell you, this 18-year-old guy could recognize immediately this 22-year-old dude. He had been with Jesus. It jumped on my heart. Isn't that what you want people to see in us? That we have been with Jesus, that we have the mindset of Christ. Let's go on to our second one now. And then make my joy complete by being like minded, having the same love. If you have the mind of Christ, you know what's going to flow out of that? Write this down. Our church that's unified is going to be marked by having the same love. If you are of the same mind, you'll have the same love. What does that mean? Now, this is powerful stuff. It means that you and I love everybody in this church the same. You don't love me more because I'm in the position of leadership. We love everyone the same. But you know, in my flesh, that's hard to do. In my flesh, I see some people that I want to be with more than others, and so do you. But we're not talking about flesh. We're talking about you're so in tune with the mind of Christ that you love each person in this church. In fact, you want, as Paul says in Romans 12, 10, you want to be devoted to these people. You want to serve them in love. Greater love hath this no man that a man would lay down his life for his friends. 1 John chapter 3, 16 through 18. Look at it with me. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? 
Dear children, let us love with words, not with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Earlier, I mentioned Acts chapter 4. If you read that chapter, what you're going to see before it talked about they were all one in heart and spirit, it talks about how everyone considered nothing they owned, that they had their own. They gave to anyone as he had need. They were living out this love. When you think the things of the Spirit, when you have the sound spiritual objective and judgment of God, when you think with the mind of Christ, when you think with maturity, when you think with spirituality, when you think heavenly thoughts, what's going to happen in this church? We're going to maintain the same love because Christ and the Spirit will be loving through you and we'll be loving one another. What a beautiful picture, and that is who we are to be as believers in Jesus Christ. We are to love one another. The opposite of that is what causes division in church. You've seen this. Listen to these words. Bitterness, envy, jealousy, personal ambition, protectionism, possessiveness. That's what grieves the Holy Spirit. Again, you can't do what I'm talking about in your flesh. You've got to have the mind of Christ. And then I love this next phrase. Look at this. Then make my joy be complete by being like-minded, having the same love. Look at this, guys. Being one in spirit. It's a really unique Greek word. Suptikoi. And suptikoi means this. Write this down in your program. It means that you and I, I love this. We are one soul. We're one soul. It's the only time in the entire Bible this phrase is used. Some think Paul made it up. It's the only time it's used. That we have such a love for Christ, such a love for each other, that we have been knit together. What the word actually means, knit deeply down in the harmony of the soul. Knit deeply down in the harmony of the soul. So what's it talking about? That you and I, together, in this church, we have the same passion. You and I have the same passion. And that passion is to love Jesus, to walk as Jesus walked. That passion is that his kingdom would be glorified through our lives. We have to have that passion to be one soul to be one soul. The fourth principle is this. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintain the same love, united in spirit, and here we go. This kind of wraps it all up in a beautiful bow. Intent on one purpose. Intent on one purpose. So write this down. A unified church is marked by having the same purpose. You know what happens when a church is in conflict? This is what happens. you got a whole lot of people who all have different purposes. That's right. But a unified church, we all have the same purpose. It's a little bit different twist on the Greek word that we started with. We have the same mindset. This word literally means we mind one thing. We mind one thing. And that one thing is advancing the kingdom of God. That's our purpose. That's who we are. We're all together. Just as George Allen motivated that team and said, 40 men together as one can't lose. We ought to feel the same way, united in the spirit. We have Christ's mind. We have that love for each other. We have that passion. And we have that purpose together. Wow, what a message from Paul. What a message. It's an honor that I'm, I was telling Sam Sevier this morning, it is an honor for me to walk with you right now. I love you guys so much. All these new families that are coming, I love you guys so much. Those that I've known for a while, I love. I, I'm telling you, Talisa and I, we are so blessed to be with you. And I don't want to see anything, anything come in and try and destroy that. Can I have an amen on that? Amen. We don't want anything to come in and destroy that. 
during World War II. Many of you know that in 1940, for 57 consecutive days, they dropped bombs on London. The Germans did. And finally, after a week or two, a group came to the Queen Mother and said this. You must get the children to safety. We must send them to Canada. Listen to what the king mother said. The queen mother said this. The children cannot go unless I go. I will not go without the king. And the king will not go. That's what I want to see here at Shannon Oaks. We're bound together. We're in this together. We know we're going to have struggles with sin in this church. We know some of you are going to struggle in your marriages. Some of you are going to struggle with your kids. Some of you are going to struggle in your jobs. You're going to have failure. We know that. But we're with you. We'll never leave you. We're tied together. We love each other and we support each other. I want to stand with a church just like that. And that's why Paul wrote Philippians chapter 2. Because that's what he wants to see in us. That's what he wants to see in us. This morning, as we close out, I want to give you two things I want to encourage you to think about this morning. One is... I want to tell you what's going to happen as it relates to unity in this church, July 10th, 17th, 24th, and 31st. We will be meeting together in the youth building, coming together, serving together, planning together, structuring our vision for this church, and every individual ministry will be at tables doing that. So when we emerge, we'll emerge united. I want you to take your card right now. Take your card right now. If you can just be here one of those nights, I know it's summertime, I know people go on vacations, but that's four consecutive Sunday nights. If you can just be here one of those Sunday nights, I just want you to write the word yes on your card. Just write the word yes. Because these four Sunday nights are so critical for the unity of our church as we move forward. I mean, I see this morning, Three families came. Last week a family came. The week before that, two families came. I see all these families coming. The question is, what are we doing with these families? Lynn Anderson said in his book, They Smell Like Sheep, if you don't use them, you're going to lose them. These Sunday nights are so critical for our church. Would you just write yes on your card if you can be here one of those Sunday nights and, and just use that this morning as an act of worship? Say, God, I give you this Sunday night. I give you two Sunday nights. God, I give you all four of those Sunday nights. I give this to you, God. I want to be a part of the unity effort of this church. And then on a second thing I want to say this morning is this. On a personal note, is there something in your life that's keeping you from having the mind of Christ? I mean, Satan comes at us, doesn't he? It may be that you have a grudge with someone. It may be you're having a struggle in a relationship. It may be you're involved with something that's fleshly, that's bringing you down. Is there something standing between you and submitting yourselves and having the mind of Christ? Don't leave this room this morning without giving that to the Lord. He'll take it away. He'll help you be successful. He will deliver you from that. In just a minute, we're going to have prayer teams on both sides. If we're going to be a united church, we got to get that stuff out of our lives. we got to move forward united, submitted to the mind of Christ. This morning, don't you leave this place unless you've done that. You've given it all to Jesus. Whatever God calls you to do in your heart this morning as we sing this song together, come forward and just pray with us. Let's all stand together and let's sing.